Um, hi. Okay, I see I'm here. <laughs> I expect it's going to be a little while until we have a few more people coming. Because everybody is still waiting for things to come in. Hi, Dale. How are you? It's nice to see you here. Uh, please excuse me while I share for a few minutes. Steve, I see you here too. So you, please also excuse me while I do a little sharing to my usual places. I'll try not to have my head below the horizon today. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> Please help me to share things out. And I will be done with this as soon as I can be, which won't be very long. Yes, I <laughs> wrestle. I am going live. There are things to talk about. I'm just sharing to a few of my favorite places. Be done in a moment. And thank you for being here, Russ and Kay. Yeah, I'm also keeping an eye on the Hills coverage. Because I know that's not going to be biased against us. <laughs> I know the Hill will be as close to objectivity as any source uh, tonight in its analysis. Okay, I just about gotten done now. I just have to clear my screens away of some of the message notifications. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going into the main screen now. And adjusting the sound to remove echoes. Do you have a link to the hill we can use too? Uh, okay, I don't have an easy link. Okay, if you go to YouTube, and search for the hill, the first thing you'll get um, as a result is their coverage. Uh, but not oh, just now. Okay, I have an eye on what's going on to hill because I have my iPad in here too. Uh, we're very, very early. Okay, it's now very, very early, only 2%. Okay, 
are reporting so far. So patterns are just beginning to appear. One pattern, which is very interesting, which is starting to appear in the results, is that Joe Biden is failing to be viable. In other words, failing to reach the threshold of 15% in uh, certain places where he was supposed to be viable. That is, where he was expected to be viable. Uh, this seems to be showing up in some of uh, the, uh, the working class areas. It seems that insofar as Biden's support is going anywhere at this point, it looks like it's going to, uh, to Buttigieg in the early going anyway. I don't know whether this particular pattern is going to continue. Um, I think that Warren has been having some, uh, some viability problems also. Uh, I don't think Bernie has had um, too many. I think that he's been performing really pretty much as expected uh, thus far. Uh, the Hill has its main analysts on now. But, okay, I think... Uh, the bottom line on this is that it's really too early to see a pattern because the percent okay, of uh, results which have come in uh, so far is simply too low. So what I want to direct our attention to at this point okay, is the future. Um, I'm going to assume this point, which may be a very large assumption to make, that uh, Bernie Sanders is going to win uh, the Iowa caucus um, um, as expected. I think the early results do not show any great surprises in that particular respect. Okay, now, right now, okay, it's Buttigieg who is uh, uh, somewhat in the lead, actually running at about 28% of the vote in um, so far, but I think that's uh, really probably due to the fact that the first of the votes that are coming in are coming in from suburban areas and some of the university areas where Buttigieg can be expected to be pretty strong. Okay, but again, it's really very early and we're not getting a, a demographic picture um, as yet, as that is matched to the candidates. So it's still very hard to see at this point what is going on. We probably need about a half hour to an hour before we can really see that. So again, I want to direct our attention to the future, and in particular, to Super Tuesday. So let me bring up just a little reference on Super Tuesday. This is uh, the, uh, the ballot um, pedia page on the primaries on Super Tuesday. And I just want to direct our attention to the uh, states and territories that are up for grabs um, on um, the Super Tuesday. And I think that's important because uh, you can sort of see okay, at this point whether there's a match with respect to, uh, to Buttigieg, uh, for example, in any of the Super Tuesday states. And at this point, 
it's very hard to see it. He has concentrated his efforts um, in the early primaries, hoping to get a boost, which can allow him to campaign in the other states. But he's done very little campaigning in the Super Tuesday states. And there's no indication that he has a lot of uh, organization in many of those particular states. Okay, at this point. But uh, let's look at what some of the polling okay, is telling us for now. Well, first of all, this is not a Super Tuesday state, but the polling in New Hampshire right now is showing things are going very heavy for Bernie Sanders. In one of the uh, latest polls, uh, uh, which I believe Kay was an Emerson College poll, uh, Bernie had 29%, and the person who was second to Bernie was Joe Biden. And Joe Biden had in that poll only 14%. So Bernie had basically doubled his total. And in that poll was sitting with a 15 point advantage. So that's New Hampshire. So I think that kind of addresses the likely hopes of Pete. Okay, when it comes to New Hampshire, he would have to pick up on Bernie 15 points uh, within, what is it, just a couple of weeks from now. Okay. That is very unlikely to happen because Bernie will be campaigning hard there too. They know Bernie extremely well. And as the race has gone forward, more and more people have been flocking to Bernie there. Okay. Um, um, I know Pete has spent a lot of money there and probably has a good organization there, but he's been losing ground to Bernie right along. If he does very well okay, in Iowa, it looks like he will do well because it looks like he's inheriting uh, by some of uh, the... Uh, uh, um, 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 he's inheriting Biden voters thus far, okay, um, um, in Iowa. If this trend continues, then you can expect that he'll be gaining votes and he'll be taking them uh, from people in New Hampshire who no longer consider that, uh, that Biden is a viable candidate. So he probably will start to go up. I think he was polling at about 11 points uh, in uh, um, New Hampshire on the same poll, okay, we've been talking about. I think Warren was at 12 points, okay, and Buttigieg was uh, um, at 11 points, if I recall correctly. So, uh, okay, but even if he picks up um, eight points, okay, from Biden, that's only going to put him at 19 to 20%. And Bernie will pick up some, okay, from Biden also. So most probably Bernie will still maintain a 15-point lead or close to it after things um, shake out over the next five days. If the trends in Iowa continue as they are, what's likely to happen is that it's Biden who's going to shake out here. He, uh, uh, his funding, okay, is likely to dry up if the trends of the night um, um, actually continue. Uh, okay, and so Buttigieg stands to gain some votes from Biden. And Bernie does too, because in a lot of the states, including um, New Hampshire, the second choice of people, um, Okay, the second choice okay, of Biden people um, has been Bernie Sanders. So we do have to uh, keep that um, in mind. So it doesn't look like Pete is going to win okay, in the New Hampshire primary. It doesn't look like he's going to win in the Iowa caucuses either. 
He might make fair showings in both of those, but where does he go then? Uh, he doesn't have an effort that's going on in South Carolina. He still has a problem uh, with, uh, with blacks. Uh, doesn't look at all good for South Carolina and not for Nevada either. In other words, Biden people may defect to him in Nevada, some of them. But a lot of them are going, to, are going to defect to Bernie and Warren in Nevada also. So I don't see Pete as really being able to mount a threat there. If he goes into Super Tuesday with nothing actually won, I think at that point his funding is going to start to dry up, maybe even before, because the establishment will be turning to uh, to Bloomberg. They'll still be looking to stop Sanders. I don't think Pete will be gaining enough, uh, fast enough. So I think his funding okay, is going to dry up for Super Tuesday. So let's look at Super Tuesday. Of course, it was expected uh, that Biden was going to be competition for Bernie in the um, southern states. But in Alabama, there's been a big investment, actually, by Bloomberg in Alabama already. So it's beginning to look to me like the competition for Bernie in Alabama is going to be from, uh, from Bloomberg and not from Biden or Buttigieg. Warren won't be popular there um, at all, I don't think. So, in Alabama, okay, and in Arkansas, okay, in Arkansas, I don't, I suspect Bernie may not be as strong there as, uh, 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 I say a Bloomberg, okay, would be. I'm sort of anticipating that by Super Tuesday, Joe Biden may be on his last legs, okay, and about to drop out. I think Bernie will be strong, okay, in Alabama, though, uh, compared uh, to, uh, to Bloomberg, because the class issues ought to loom extremely large there. And I think support for Bernie among Southern Blacks is going to spread fairly rapidly uh, when uh, um, Joe Biden weakens. <coughs> so I expect to see that trend. Now we know recent polls in California are showing uh, that Bernie has a big lead in California. If he wins, okay, in Iowa tonight, and wins, okay, in New Hampshire, and then goes to South Carolina and makes a strong showing there because Biden, okay, is fading, then Bernie's lead is going to maintain or is going to grow, okay, in California. Okay. And Bernie was ahead in California by, I believe, in some of the latest polls, uh, by nine or ten points, had 30 points already okay, in California. So, some of the others were starting to fade. I think his main competition in California seems to be Warren, okay, at this point. And, and I don't know whether that will stay the same or whether Bloomberg will start becoming um, important. Now, in Colorado, Bernie also looks very strong. He was strong in Colorado in 2016. He should be strong again. I think among the Democrats abroad, it's probably going to be between Bernie, okay, and Warren, if she stays in the race, and maybe Tulsi as well. But if you consider, okay, that the Democrats abroad okay, are living among the citizens, okay, of other nations that are looking, okay, at our elections and looking at America, 
with a great amount of disfavor due to Trump. Okay. It seems to me okay, that a lot of the citizens okay, that uh, the Americans okay, are living among will start talking favorably about the United States because of Bernie Sanders. They'll be starting to speak very favorably that will finally be joining the rest of the um, um, industrial world in certain respects. And our favorability rating in many of the countries in Europe will start to go up because of how well Bernie is doing okay, in this particular election. And that's going to reinforce the popularity of Bernie okay, among the Democrats abroad. Now, okay, in Maine, uh, seems to me it's Bernie and Warren in Maine, especially with Biden fading. And Warren will not come out of Iowa, will not come out of the New Hampshire race actually looking very strong. So here again, Bernie looks strong to do well in Maine. Now we've gone through already a lot of the Super Tuesday states and Bernie looks in a very good position to benefit from a good showing in Iowa and from a New Hampshire victory. That's very likely to happen. And of course, Massachusetts, that is Warren's state. And technically, she should be very strong there. But she hasn't been that popular a senator. Uh, that's the truth of the matter. They don't like her as well as perhaps they should in Massachusetts. It's nothing like the popularity that, uh, that, uh, that Bernie has in his state. In Vermont, Bernie is enormously popular. But Warren is not so popular. Bernie will be very well organized um, in Massachusetts. I don't know if he'll be strong enough to win against her. But if anybody is strong enough to win against her or make a very good showing in Massachusetts, um, it's going to be Bernie. And frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't beat her in the Massachusetts primary. I mean, he can easily campaign there. He's very familiar to Massachusetts people. He's probably very popular, okay, among them. It's going to be a tough race for Warren in her home state. Okay, now when we get to Minnesota, it's Bernie versus Amy Klobuchar. And the question is, is Amy going to be in for, two, for Super Tuesday? If she's not viable in Iowa, and she doesn't do very well in New Hampshire, both of which I think are very good possibilities now. She's been having a few viability problems tonight. If those things happen, will she continue um, into Super Tuesday? Now, the establishment may support her and urge her to stay in at least until Super Tuesday, because they would much rather, of course, she won in Minnesota than, uh, than Bernie. So for the purpose of holding the delegates, they're probably going to fund her very well. But even if they do, the Bernie organization in Minnesota is pretty damn strong. He's going to give her a run for her money there. Even though, of course, historically, she's been very strong in Minnesota. She's been a popular senator there, still. But I think Bernie's even got a shot at winning Minnesota against her. Now we move to North Carolina. 
there we're probably going to see Bloomberg spending money, okay, in um, North Carolina. But the question is, who a black voter is going to go for in a Democratic primary inside, okay, of North Carolina? Seems to me, seems to me, that's likely to be Bernie. He's already made a number of appearances inside, okay, of North Carolina and had some very successful campaign stops there. And his surrogates there are very popular people. And Reverend Barber is very likely to back him in North Carolina. Is Bloomberg going to be able to win in North Carolina just on the strength of the money that he can spend and the blizzard of ads that he's going to manufacture there? I don't know. With Biden out of the race, which is likely to happen by Super Tuesday, because if Biden doesn't do sufficiently well tonight, he may well collapse before Super Tuesday. I don't believe that he's really financially viable. If the establishment starts stampeding to Bloomberg and there are indications that that is going to happen, then I I see Bernie taking the primary in North Carolina. Now, how about um, Oklahoma? Bernie's got a pretty strong organization in Oklahoma, comparatively speaking. Now, that is one of Warren's home states because she was born there. I can't say how they're going to stack up there. But I suspect that right now, Bernie Sanders has a stronger organization than she has Okay, in Oklahoma. So we'll just have to see how that works out. Now, okay, in Tennessee... I don't know how strong Bernie is going to be there. His policies should be very, very strong there, but I don't know about the strength of his organization in Tennessee. Now, as we move to Texas, which is, of course, the most important state other than California in the Super Tuesday situation, Now, we've been seeing from recent polls that Bernie has been closing fast on Joe Biden in uh, 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 Texas. And one recent poll there, the most recent poll, shows Bernie behind by only 30% to 25% in uh, Texas. So what happens if Bernie wins in Iowa and he wins in um, New Hampshire, and he does well in South Carolina, and then he uh, he wins the Nevada primary. All are likely events now. And meanwhile, Biden is collapsing all around him. What happens to Biden's support um, in Texas? Um, I think the Texas firewall for Biden is just going to crack. It's not going to be a firewall. And before you know it, it's going to be a situation where Bernie and some of the progressive Texans who are running along with him are starting to make a major dent in the Democratic Party um, inside the okay, of Texas. I wouldn't be at all surprised if Bernie was to win the Texas primary. By the way, winning the California primary handily and the Texas primary handily, that's going to be devastating. It's going to be devastating in terms of Super Tuesday delegates. You throw in all the other states, okay, we're talking about here. Oh, 
Super Tuesday looks to me like it's coming up as a sweep for Bernie. Now, what are the last three states? One, okay, is Utah. Now, Bernie was very strong in Utah in 2016. He had a really good organization there in 2016. He's got to be the favorite right now to win the Democratic primary in Utah. Conservative though the state um, is, Bernie's organization was strong there. And he did very well there in 2016. Okay, And then of course we get to Vermont and he's got a lock on Vermont. So now we come to Virginia, the last state in Super Tuesday. How is Bernie going to do here in my state, in Virginia? Well, Virginia is a very centrist, uh, um, a democratic state. It's a state which, after a long dry spell, has come to be controlled by Democrats, but they are all centrist Democrats. There are no progressive Democrats here. Uh, the most progressive Democrat here is probably Don Beyer, okay, in Alexandria, by virtue of the fact that uh, there's an urban population, okay, blacks, which is pretty large, okay, in Alexandria, and pretty progressive. Okay, but Bayer has always been a centrist Democrat. He's been a Clintonite. He has been a Clintonite. And he will probably remain so. And my congressperson, whose name is uh, 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 Jennifer Wexton, is a, uh, she's a very pleasant, very smooth, and very civil person who has not come around to Medicare for all yet is responsive to the donor class, has tendencies to be strong when it comes to, uh, to green policies, but has not gone over to the GND yet. Uh, what I think I'm saying is, I don't see much organization in this state to support a campaign that would be successful uh, for a progressive Democrat okay, like Bernie Sanders. He'll be popular here among a certain set. He can come here and he can draw a large crowd here. He did so in 2016 and he will again. Um, he will again. But if he gets competition from a Bloomberg here, the whole state machinery will line up in back, in back okay, of, you know, of Bloomberg. And Bloomberg will flood this area with ads. And I think it would be very hard um, for Bernie to swing too many people in which in many areas is a pretty affluent uh, state. Now, yes, there are poor areas in Virginia, and Bernie's program will be attractive to them. Okay, But considering the fact that the establishment here is very strong statewide, and even in many of the poor areas, I doubt that Bernie will be able to swing Virginia into his column. So that's my analysis of Bernie's prospects for Super Tuesday. I think the terrain there is very, very favorable to Bernie. 
especially if uh, the projections for tonight work out as expected. And I think they are thus far working out um, as expected. But I'm going to shift now. I'm going to shift over to what you have to say, because I know that some of you have been watching The Hill while I've been talking to you, and that there are many more results in now. When I last left uh, The Hill, they were talking... And they were talking roughly 2%, okay, of the results in. Uh, I think there's probably more than 2% of the votes now. But I'm going to break my pattern here a little. I'm going to check your comments out. And I'm going to check in with the Hill coverage also. So, okay, this Hill said something that was very pregnant, I think, uh, just now. Uh, it was actually Sager uh, um, who had pointed this out. So far, they still got only 2% of the results. That's what they had at roughly 10.05, okay, or 10.10. 10. Okay. Uh, he was saying that by this time, three quarters of the caucus results were in in 2016. So obviously, what is going on here, okay, what seems to be going on here, is that let me check and see what's going on. I probably have to shift my view here so you're not getting uh, all of the tunneling. Let me go back to my basic view. So, so in other words, in 2016, the results were coming in much, much faster. The heavier turnout Okay, there is reportedly very heavy turnout there uh, so far. Okay. And that particular turnout, of course, heavy turnout is going to favor Bernie Sanders. But at the same time, it's going to take them longer. It is taking them longer to go through the caucus process and to arrive at uh, the um, final results okay, in each of the areas. Uh, and so uh, we don't yet have um, too many results in. Okay, so I'm going to go back and continue to check on your comments. I don't know why my view has not shifted. By now, you should be seeing me alone on the screen. And I'm not getting that. Oh, here I am. Okay. 
Susan says, I heard the wealthy suburbs are going with Pete. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. But I heard that actually fairly early. Yeah, Bloomberg isn't a real Democrat. He ran for mayor as a Republican. So Lana points out that Florida is going to be very interesting, but they don't vote until St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Steve says Bernie, 142, Warren, 42. Precinct 3, first alignment, 142, 42, 34 for Yang, 37 for Pete, 10 for Biden, and Amy 8. That case is emblematic of the collapse of Biden. We're seeing the collapse of Biden today. I'm getting to your comments now. It takes me a little time to scroll and really see them. Okay. Um, evidently, the Des Moines Register poll that was taken on Saturday uh, was leaked. Does anybody know what uh, the results were on that? Maybe the Hill covered that, but I didn't um, hear them announce what the results were. Lana says, that's me, Super Tuesday State. Yeah, and that's me too, Super Tuesday State. And Russ says, Georgia doesn't vote until March 24th. It'll probably already be decided by then. Hopefully, it'll be decided by then for Bernie. Hopefully. If it's still undecided by then, it means that Bernie's having a little trouble, okay, in wrapping it up. Kay says, Ohio votes on St. Patty's Day. Go figure. <laughs> and Dale says, um, New Jersey won't vote till the 2nd of June. Steve says, a mostly Latino caucus site with 185 um, um, voters. Bernie wins 94% of the vote. <laughs> He's a Santa's precinct captain going through the process of selecting the nine delegates for the campaign. They have earned with the big win. Kay says, looks like Biden is sinking fast. And Steve says, Biden and Klobuchar are switching to booty jag. Uh, to a to Buddha judge. And Richard uh, Dean uh, Winfield has joined us. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, I am planning to see him for an interview tomorrow night. He is running for the Senate in Georgia. Lana says, I can't wait for someone to primary Klobuchar. Uh, when does she run again? Doesn't she have still another four years to go before she runs again in her state? I thought she just won like uh, 2016 or something like that. 2018. Even. Lana says, Teresa told me that, uh, that Bloomberg is buying staff from, uh, from Bernie's volunteer group okay, in Oklahoma. 
Oh, well, that's a bad sign if uh, they're susceptible to, uh, to being bought because Bernie is paying his staff too, isn't he? Of course, it's possible for, uh, for Bloomberg to pay more. He can pay as much as he wants. Kay says, I think she's a loser, Lana. Nobody likes her much except for the Hillary bots. Um, talking Amy Klobuchar, of course, here. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Oh, in the Ames Precinct 3, uh, the viability number is 43. So the only viable candidate right now uh, is Bernie. Of course, after the realignment on the second round, there are likely to be some other viable candidates because not everybody's going to switch over to Bernie. So somebody is likely to get to 42. It'll be better for Bernie if it's Pete. If it's Pete okay, uh, or Biden okay, or Amy who get the 42, that would probably be, be better for, for Bernie because then some of Warren's people would, uh, would realign uh, to Bernie. Sorry, I guess. I'm under the horizon again. Kay says, Iowa needs to move to primary elections. The caucuses are really uh, antiquated, not really fair if you think about how many people have to work nights and are not able to um, participate. Yeah, that's true, but there are a lot of people who are not able to participate okay, in daytime elections either. Because um, in many states, okay, election day is not a holiday. As you know, it's not a national holiday. Steve Gonzo says, Iowa Democratic Party, we're currently doing quality control on Iowa caucuses and don't have an ETA on results. Lana says, must be closer than they um, anticipated. Uh, that is, unless they're cheating Bernie again. Susan says, I heard the wealthy suburbs are going with Pete. Steve says, Des Moines Precinct 80, Bernie's group had 101 people. Pete's group had 66 people. Bernie and Pete end up tied at four delegates following a coin toss. This is democracy? Yeah, this is ridiculous. That is really ridiculous. How do 101 people equate to 66 people? That is ridiculous. Susan says, was this expected? What's up with the coin toss? Yeah, Bernie now has a string of coin tosses that he's, he's lost. If we count the six from 2016, this is the seventh coin toss in a row that Bernie has lost. What are the chances of that? Nancy Blackmar has joined. Susan asks, how does it look for Bernie? I think it's still too early to say. Okay, and, uh, and Lana says, I think all states should primary on the same day. Lana says, yes, unfortunately. Check out the new comments. Steve says, I don't know, following Iowa Caucus on Twitter uh, and others, it's hard to get a full picture. <laughs> Seems like the stupid apps which the devs have decided to use this time are not working. 
SMH, no real surprise. Yeah, I think that was planned. That was probably designed in. Defies the law of cave probability. Well, the six consecutive coin tosses also defied the law's cave probability. I smell a rat. I smell a rat too. But the thing is, Bernie is much better organized than Iowa this time. So his people should be much more aware of what okay is actually going on. So Michael Brooks is talking on the hill now. They're talking Bloomberg. Still waiting for results. Obviously, they don't have any results. I am going to shift now. Okay, I wanted to call your attention uh, to this article, which has appeared in Common Dreams, still loading. You should be able to see it in just a minute. <laughs> the title of it is 10 Reasons Sex Will Be Better with Bernie. <laughs> okay, it's by Hadass uh, Silver and Mary Summers. This was done on January 29th. Uh, and so the question is put, what does it really take to have um, truly mind-blowing sex? Here are 10 tips. Okay, so point number one, or tip number one, sex should be risque, not um, risky. And what the author does is to tie in much better sex to a good healthcare system where people, not profits, come first. A system that provides free contraception and uh, which allows women to terminate uh, their uh, their pregnancies and supports those who chooses to bring their pregnancies to terms. The system that uh, takes care okay, of STDs and provides trans services and allows us to stay limber into our twilight years. That sounds really good to me. And the point, for the best sex, we need Medicare for all. <laughs> Number two, sex is better when you can focus on the job at hand. Great sex happens when we have enough time to connect, when we're not exhausted from working three jobs. I'll let you fill in the, the rest of this paragraph, but you get 
the point. Shorter work work, work weeks, paid um, family leave, various things. Okay, various things uh, that uh, that Bernie proposes to do will help you to focus on the job at hand. Also, for a great time in bed, in bed you need some uh, some privacy. That okay is number three. So if you have an affordable home without 10 roommates or predatory loan sharks or absentee landlord, that's going to do wonders for your sex life. And four, of course, part of privacy includes not having toddlers in your bedroom. Of course, <laughs> if you can afford a better place, the kids will have their own room. And they'll have safe and affordable places to play. Childcare gives us the time and space we need to be better parents, friends, and lovers. Not to mention just happier people ourselves. Number five, we all need to understand what sex is. And that, of course, means we need schools that are safe, well-funded, and staffed with knowledgeable sex ed teachers. For hotter but very safe sex, we need great schools. By the way, I've been quoting from this article here um, all along. Anyway, I urge you to read it. It's good for a few laughs. And it's also really to the point. All kinds of things in the Sanders program are conducive to better sex and to the greater degree of happiness in marriage that it can bring or happiness outside of marriage that it can bring as well. Uh, sex is better when the environment isn't toxic and the planet is not burning. Yes. Yeah, economic independence is a huge turn on. Indeed it is. And so, and so, uh, the, uh, the tenth point, sex would be better with Bernie Sanders. Bernie is the only candidate that leaves no one behind, and public programs that support the public good will mean better sex for all of us. Other politicians will promise you the moon. Only Bernie Sanders can improve your sex life. Everybody in, nobody out. Because when everyone is doing better, that's sexy as hell. Unquote. So I did want to call your attention to that. I thought it was a notable article from the standpoint of introducing a little humor into the situation. But boy, it's a very good reason, supported by 10 other very good reasons, to go big for Bernie. So the Hill is now giving some coverage to Yang. There was an article by Warren Cole I wanted to call your attention to as well. Uh, let me check in with you first before I get to that. <laughs> Russ says sexy article. So the Hill people are joking and saying they wonder whether uh, quality control is the new hanging chad because the Iowa people are saying they're quality controlling the results. 
uh, uh, by the way, uh, the Des Moines Register Pope on Saturday uh, uh, had Bernie winning the uh, the caucus. Uh, so what the Democratic Party is reporting in Iowa now is that 25% of the results are in and the turnout, okay, the turnout is looking like the 2016 turnout. And Michael Brooks says, he has yoga in the morning and he would like some rest. <laughs> they are talking about Okay, the results are very fragmentary um, as yet. They have not reported any results from the 25% yet. So we don't know who is leading in the 25% of the results. And we don't know where the outstanding results um, are coming from. Kay says, I might have to wait until morning to see the results at this rate. Well, obviously they still need some more results. So, I'm going to go back to the next article I intended to call your attention to. And that article is was written by Juan Cole. It also appeared in Common Dreams. It appeared in Truth Dig also. I happened to see it okay, in Truth Dig, traced it back to Common Dreams. But it's on the big issues, Bernie Sanders is the only one who can save America. And one Cole writes pretty good story here. He says, um, human beings are being gradually boiled and they aren't uh, bothering to drop, to jump out of the pan. Uh, that's the story of the frogs, of course. But it turns out if you put a healthy frog into such a pan, in fact, they will jump out of the pan. It's only a frog that's not so healthy that will be boiled to death. But we human beings are being gradually boiled. So the U.S. leadership is for the most part blind to the three massive crises that have gripped the country and which threaten its existence. And the three important points are, one, the climate emergency, the crisis of plutocracy and inequality, and the extinction crisis and corporate uh, uh, destruction of the environment. Or, as he says, uh, the pollution of the environment by corporations. But I think it's more like the destruction of the environment. He points out that we're going to suffer badly from the effects of the climate crisis and he goes through the various areas where we're going to suffer and he points out that of course this is produced by letting greenhouse gases into the air uh, by using um, fossil fuels he points out that the crisis is not in the distant future but is now and then he says, we have a choice. In the next two decades, it can be bad or worse or very bad. He says, if we swing into action now, we can keep it to only bad. Say 3.6 degrees to 5 degrees of Fahrenheit increase in average global surface temperature. He says, that doesn't sound like much, but it's the average, including the poles and the seas and the mountains. So Phoenix, Arizona could be looking at a 15 degree Fahrenheit increase. 
Don't think Phoenix is going to be very happy with that. Don't think it's going to be very happy with that. Maybe they'll have to build um, tunnels under the city so people can go from one place to another under the city and stay cool. Of course, they'll have plenty of solar energy there to keep uh, their houses air conditioned. That should work. <laughs> anyway, he asks, what good would it do to have Americans have better and universal health care if a boiling earth is going to harm their health anyway? Why spend $1 trillion a year on national defense if the real enemy is our own seas and atmosphere, which is planning for us catastrophes the Soviet Union or Iran never did or could? And Juan says, terrorism is a piddling little minor problem. You're more likely to fall down and hit your head in your shower than you are ever to be harmed by a terrorist. And then he says, he makes the point, Bernie is the only candidate running this climate action plan. Is it all equal to the challenge? Uh, he says, the issue cannot be addressed by indirect means, as Warren has urged. He says, we need a government that will muscle in with big grid energy and infrastructure changes. He says, only Bernie is committed to something on that scale. Of course, I've said similar things in the past to you. He points out the climate crisis is much more dire threat than Hitler's axis was. Hitler was defeated by the U.S. government, not by the private sector, he points out. The government brought in 14 million men and spent, spent 14 trillion in 2020 dollars, not to mention funding the invention of the atomic bomb. And he points out, nobody that I know of argues we should have let IBM and the Pinkerton Agency take on the Nazis while strangling the federal government in the bathtub. You may as well call the U.S. war effort in World War II, quote, socialist, unquote, as to call the Green New Deal by that term. But neither is actually socialist, and they do not involve the public ownership of the means of um, 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 production. They're both a form of managed capitalism, which is very true. That's what they are. He says the most extreme threat to our democracy is the emergence of uh, the plutocratic uh, class. Inequality is skyrocketing. He says the top 1% holds more wealth than the middle class. They own 29% or over 25 trillion of household wealth in 2016 while the middle class owns just 18 trillion. Of course, it's worse now. It's 2020 now. That's a 2016 figure. It's got to be worse now. It must be 35 trillion versus 16 trillion now. God. He says, when you combine this rising inequality with the inability of half of Americans to make ends meet, you're looking at an eventual social explosion. In the fact, the rise of Trumpian fascism from 2016 is a symptom of that coming conflict. He points out that we are not naturally stable. If the trend lines continue with regard to inequality, we can have the sort of problems other unequal societies, such as the Sudan and Brazil, have. And then he refers to the Supreme Court's finding that money is speech and cannot be regulated. And he says, he ties this into the development of the plutocracy. And then he points out microfibers and microplastics are everywhere in fish. They've accumulated in key organs and cause starvation and sterility. And they're accumulating in us too and they attract uh, carcinogenic chemicals and concentrate them in key organs. He says this development is extremely alarming 
As a cancer survivor, that angers me to a boiling rage. And me too, I'm a cancer survivor also. And so is Bonnie. And then he points out uh, the crisis called the insect um, Armageddon, in which we wiped out 70% of insects. In North America alone killed off 3 billion birds since 1970. Wiped out 70% of insects since that date. In Puerto Rico, 98% of ground insects are gone. In Oklahoma, the honeybee stock has fallen from over 6 million at the end of World War II to some 3 million uh, today. And then he goes on talking about his personal um, um, experiences. And then he points to the role of the media, CNN and Fox, are largely owned by Randolph Stevenson and Murdoch, respectively. Both of them are big boosters as Trump. As billionaires, they're heavily invested in all the corporations and activities that have produced the sixth major extinction. Publicizing the crisis would hurt the stocks in which they are invested. This is also the reason that TV news does not convey to us the seriousness of the climate um, um, emergency. Yeah, at, uh, okay, Bernie is now at 28%. With 2%, all they got is 2% reporting now. These media are in the water in which you will boil. They aren't a kindly rescuer. Okay, Buttigieg has a 24% with 2% in. Biden only has 11%. So Biden is not viable right now at all. This is with 2% in. Only 2% in. Klobuchar has 12%. More than Biden. Yeah, Iowa has a major snafu, which is perhaps not surprising. Evidently, Robbie Mook, the former manager of Hillary Clinton's campaign, has been involved with this app that the Iowans decided to, to, <laughs> to use for this caucus. It's being pointed out okay, by the Hill people that the whole advantage of having somebody report okay, at 10 o'clock let's say, that they've won the Iowa caucus and getting this big bump from all the, um, all the publicity. It's now 11.15. There isn't going to be any big bump. I guess the one thing that's really, really happening, though, which may provide um, um, not a bump, but a tank, a, t a total tank, is how Biden is doing. I mean, Biden so far with 2% of the vote in is totally tanking. Only 11% less than Klobuchar. But here's what's shaping up with 2% in. And I don't know whether this is going to stick at all. But the possibility from 2% is that Klobuchar and Biden's votes go to Pete. They're saying, okay, that the deteriorate, that since uh, Bernie Sanders is the second choice, okay, of Biden voters, he could get a lot of Biden's 11%. But here's the problem. Amy Klobuchar is not viable also, and she's at 12%. If most of her people go to Pete, most of them go to Sneaky Pete, then what? Then what? Then maybe Pete emerges as the victor in the Iowa caucus. Now, this will be of no consequence, a little consequence anyway, because of the fact that it's coming so late when everybody's asleep, and when the mass media don't have the viewership that they have tonight, so they won't be able to push the victory of Pete. But I suppose 
from their point of view, it's better to engineer through for fraud a Pete victory and not be able to publicize it in the way they would like to than to um, have Bernie win by 10 o'clock and be able to trumpet that. Okay, so Bernie has his own app to log in the votes from all the caucuses, not under control of the state party. So you can be sure that if there's a discrepancy between what Bernie's app shows and what the state app shows, it's very likely Bernie is going to be suing. And if he sh sues... We won't know the results of the Iowa caucus for months and months. So the Iowa caucus is probably going to zero out, but the polls will be showing that Bernie was the most likely winner of the Iowa caucus. So then he'll go to New Hampshire and he'll sweep in New Hampshire where things aren't going to be so crooked as they are okay, evidently in Iowa. And what are we going to have then? Well, I think we're going to have Bernie looking very, very strong going into Nevada and South Carolina. I don't think Bernie's momentum is going to be stopped by this very much. Anyway, to end uh, the Juan Cole article, he ends it by saying, and Bernie is the only one to step in and take big action to address the extinction crisis? Question mark. Yes, Bernie is the only one. So I wanted to call your attention to that article. I think it was a very good one. Now I'm back on my page, okay. Let me then get rid of the article and let me go back to your comments. There we go. I guess we're not there yet. Okay, so you are hanging in there. Oh, the, I see the Hill coverage is now over. So we have to get coverage from somebody else. The easiest thing for me to go to is the live stream from... So there's a statement from Amy Klobuchar going on now, okay, at MS, uh, NBC, okay, or at NBC. Uh, the stuff on the bottom, I don't think, oh, that's the entrance poll uh, results. Okay, so Amy is saying she has beaten the odds. Lana says nothing is being reported. Yes, I did say Robbie Schnook. Absolutely. Democratic Leadership Council. This is absurd. It's almost 1030. Nothing is being reported. It's 10.30 your time. It's 11.30 here on the East Coast. And NBC is reporting all kinds of non-relevant statistics on the bottom from their entrance poll. So, I'm going to check in with Jordan Chariton. 
and see what he's reporting. Oops. Yes, I was in your time zone. That's right. I know. Okay. So Amy is BSing right now, saying nothing very meaningful. I'm skipping to the Young Turks coverage. Since the Hill coverage seems to have ended. Okay, so junk is on my iPad screen right now. Okay, so the people who are providing coverage are basically marking time at this point because no results are in. Okay, I'm going to stay on here for a little while longer in hopes that they'll be reporting some results. But I'd say Iowa has gotten itself a fiasco right now. Russ says, I've got to turn in, sadly. My work week starts very soon. See you all again soon. Thanks for coming, Russ. Sorry the results are here. Rising said they'll come back when more results are released. I will watch for them. I will watch for them. Okay, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I think you can watch the results um, as well as I from here on in. Obviously, there has been a glitch. There most probably is considerable cheating that is going on um, at the level of uh, the state party, okay, in Iowa. There are probably some Hillary Clinton people in there who are, uh, who are messing with the results. Sandy Degg has joined. 
Hi, Sandy. Uh, uh, I'm going to stay up and find out what's going on. Yeah, Jenk is making the obvious point here, asking whether the people in Iowa didn't think that something would be going wrong with the new app. They didn't think the possibility would be there. They should have had it thoroughly debugged. And they should have had trial runs for using the app and training for everybody who had to use it. If they couldn't do that, they shouldn't have introduced a new app. This was supposed to speed up the reporting time. That's why they put it in. And it was supposed to guard against cheating. And now they have a disaster. What if it's a foreign country? So Jack brought up the possibility. What if it's a foreign country that's been hacking into the results? I mean, what if the results are getting hacked into by the Russians? And that they've been fixing up it for Mayor Buttigieg? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I joke. It's a bad joke. Why didn't they just do paper ballots? Because they want the possibility of cheating. It's a feature, not a bug. Lana says they probably left it with bugs on purpose. Yes, it's a feature. It's not a bug. If they really cared, they would have gone with Tulsi Gabbard's um, uh, legislation for paper ballots long ago. Sandy says, more bullcrap. Look, I am beginning to think that the only way to get around this is going to be to go into the streets and to stay there until we get what we want for as long as it takes. Because um, um, these elections don't work. So the Sanders campaign today is announcing that they've been monitoring things very closely. So anyway, the Sanders campaign uh, supposedly has an accounting method okay, of its own. Okay, um, Brian Marcus says, what happens when Bernie gets robbed um, by yet again? That depends on us. If we go into the streets and we create enough of a fuss, and we tie up everything for the Democratic Party okay, in Iowa. Mm. 
then something different may happen. My daughter says, I've been wondering if wearing yellow vests for all Bernie voters would help to reinforce uh, how many we are. It may well be. And Sandy says, we revolt. We have to be careful when we use language here. We don't want to lose our access. We want to be careful. When we say going into the streets, that's fine. We're not saying, all we're talking about here is our right okay, of assembly in the streets. And Kay says, I've been hearing that if Bernie gets robbed again, that people will be in the streets. I think a lot of people will be in the streets. Not only that, but I think the Democratic Party is done. It's just going to break up. I mean, what is it now? It's an instrument to the oligarchy. It represents them and only them. I mean, it doesn't represent anybody else. And as long as it doesn't represent anybody else, uh, what is going to happen then is that we will realize that we don't gain anything from continuing to support this particular charade of party politics involving the Democrats and the Republicans. And Brian says, Brian said something about, oh yeah, uh, remember when Clinton and Debbie Wasserman Schultz did this in the last election? Um, Bernie will bend uh, the knee again. Well, I think again, it all depends on what we do. If we're all out there and we're not listening, okay, and we're not listening, and we're all screaming at him that his agreement was one thing, but it assumed a fair process. Bernie is live now saying he's waiting for the Iowa results. Uh, yeah, Bernie is live now. He's talking about it. Uh, let me see okay, if I can get that. I may be able to get that. I'll have to. Unfortunately, I don't see it yet. Maybe, oh, he's live now. Let me get this.
Am I getting it on? Getting a stream starting soon. I'm afraid I can't get what he's saying. Ah, maybe it's coming in now. Okay, I'm going to sign off. Okay, and let you find it. His statement is important. The Hill people will be coming on again um, somewhat later, but I'm not going to hold you up any further. Okay, I'm going to end this stream here. And I'm going to find out what Bernie is saying. I advise you all to check it out too.